Okay, um, so we were discussing X branch localization. Um, and so, um, so in particular, we added one more Q exact term to the, to the action, uh, one uh, new localization term. This, of course, is not going to change the result. However, you remember this term was not positive definite. Um, well, I didn't show it, but uh, I told you. But then one can integrate out uh, exactly the D term uh, because it's an auxiliary field. This somehow cor was corresponding to changing the integration contour for this auxiliary field. And because of that, the, the um, uh, BPS equations, the, the, the BPS solutions to the BPS equations that live on the contour that we choose, since now we have changed the contour, they are different. And in particular, as we said, Essentially, I didn't show all the details uh, because, okay, I don't have so much time, but essentially the, the story is similar to uh, Penston's case on S4 in the sense that in the bulk of the sphere, so first of all, there are two special points that we can call North Pole and South Pole. These are singled out by our choice of um, uh, supercharge that we use to localize. So at our disposal, we have four, well, two of these guys and two of these guys, and here we choose one here and one here. And this choice selects uh, two antipodal points. Uh, so in the bulk, uh, the solutions, uh, well, I remember also this was some, um, some uh, let me call it Q exact parameter. And this, is, this was a parameter that appears in the Q exact term. So this is not a parameter that will affect the answer, but it might affect the presentation of the answer. And uh, what I'm going to say is only valid for the limit in which this parameter goes to infinity. One can study the system for any value of chi, but then there are some differential equations that I'm, I'm not going to write. Uh, but, but OK, when this parameter is not infinite, but say is large, uh, one has a smoothening out of this, of this story. And then, uh, again, I'm, I'm not going to write here. You can find on the papers. Uh, so what happens? So in the, in the bulk, we are on the Higgs branch. Uh, and, uh, um, okay, let me stress, so let me put this in quotation mark. I mean, um, this is an analogy, of course, so the theory is on S2, okay, there is no time, there is no Hamiltonian associated to S2, uh, so this is not I mean, it's, it's not that the theory is physically put on the X branch, right? This is just an analogy to understand what type of BPS configurations contribute to this path integral, OK? So let me put this in quotation mark. Um, uh, so what I mean by this is simply that the field strength is 0, and uh, the, the, the chiral multiplets satisfy the D-term equation with this fake uh, parameter or Q exact parameter, and this is precisely, if you solve this equation on flat space, this would uh, give you the, the X branch. So here the analogy. However, at North Pole and South Pole, uh, you have more interesting equations, because at least in the limit, you have, uh, and the, uh, this plus or minus uh, refers to the two poles, This dagger, we should better write it as a uh, tilde, but we are on a, we chose a contour in which actually phi tilde is complex conjugate of phi, so I could also use a dagger here. And then we have this uh, either z bar or z, uh, phi equal to zero. And these are the vortex equations. So this is the locus. Uh, the BPS locus, uh, and so now we have to integrate or sum over this different set of BPS equations. Uh, but apart from that, the, the, the story is, is always the same. We have to evaluate classical action, we have to evaluate one loop determinants, and then we have to sum or integrate. Um, okay, and, and this is interesting because vortices are uh, essentially the instantons in, 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 in two dimensions.
Okay, so, um, so, so, okay, so first of all, we have these, uh, these branches. And as I told you, in general, it's not just one, but it's some finite number. So this, this part, so there will be a sum over this. This is not particularly interesting. It's just a statement that uh, if this is the would-be Coulomb branch, so uh, if you want this is, um, this parameterized what yesterday we called A, I think. That was sigma 1. <laughs> Uh, and then depending on the twisted masses that you turn on, and I think also the R charges and so on, there are some special points uh, where uh, some component of this phi, so this phi is both charged under the gauge group and under the flavor group, so it contains a lot of components. And the special points are points where one of these components is, uh, is massless. Uh, and so this would be X branch opens up. Uh, but there are many of these points. In fact, essentially, there is one point for each, essentially, for each uh, component, morally speaking, of this. Well, okay, there is more than one. So. Okay, and once again, these points were uh, identified by the equation sigma 1 plus m phi equal to 0. So it's precisely correspond when one component, uh, sorry, when one component of this matrix, this is a matrix in gauge space, this is a matrix in uh, if you want, in the adjoint of the gauge group, this is in the adjoint of the flavor group, and when this big matrix has a zero eigenvalue, then the corresponding component can, uh, can, can be different from zero. Okay, okay is, is, is this so far everything is clear? Okay. So, uh, well, the interesting part now is this part here, uh, because now we have to uh, integrate over the modular space of solutions to these equations. Sorry, can you explain again? So you said that at these points, phi's are masses. Yeah. The one component of the phi is masses. So and what, what, is, what is the cone supposed to mean? Oh, it's supposed to mean that now phi, that component now can be different from zero. And so the cone, or maybe I should write it as a complex line, uh, it's the fact that you can choose different expectation value for this phi. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, but in fact, this expectation value is fixed uh, <coughs> because we also have the equation, we also have uh, this other equation, which is telling you that, uh, so if you have just one component, this is completely fixing the, uh, the, the modulus, uh, and the phase will be fixed by gauge uh, invariant, by gauge transformation. So. Yeah, so this, this cone opens up, uh, but in fact there is a single, or maybe I should draw it as a line, uh, but there is a single point which is selected then by this equation. <coughs> so yeah, so in fact this part is uh, pretty boring, it's just a finite sum over these various components. There is no I I integral there. Okay, um, so what about these, uh, these uh, solutions? So these are very similar to the instanton equations in many respects. So if you know something about instantons, uh, well, many of the things go, go, go through in this case. Essentially, the modular space of solutions to these equations is separated into disconnected branches. And each branch is characterized by a number, uh, essentially, which is the vortex number, the equivalent, if you want, of the instanton number. And, uh, well, for instance, if you take un, which will be our uh, example, uh, then uh, you just, so we are in two dimensions, so what you can do is you integrate this f um, uh, either or on, on, on r2, well, essentially on neighborhood of the, of the point, uh, and this is going to be the vortex number. in particular is an integer, and so you have these disconnected components in which you change the vortex number, uh, and then for each vortex number you have some modular space of vortices. Um, so you have these guys here, and then for each of the, com of the points in this modular space, what you are supposed to do is to compute the classical action, compute the one-loop determinants, and put everything together. 
Um, now, of course, in this background, it's more complicated to compute uh, the one-loop determinants, and one needs um, uh, index theorems. One cannot compute the spectrum uh, by hand. Um, so I'm not going to explain how to do that, but one can do that. I just want to give you the general idea. And so the final form of the formula, uh, if you want a little bit uh, abstractly, is the following. So there will be this finite sum of the Higgs branches. Uh, and, and the stress, this is finite. So it's not an infinite series or something complicated. And then there will be the classical action. There will be some one-loop determinant. And then... Uh, um, and then there will be the contribution from vortices at one, at one, uh, from one uh, to one uh, pole and the anti-vortices at the other pole. So let me write these expressions. Uh, so, uh, so what is this? Well, uh, so first of all, the one-loop determinant, well, it, it turns out that the one-loop determinant in each of these vortex backgrounds is the same as the one that we compute, uh, computed yesterday. Uh, the only difference is that uh, you have to, uh, essentially, some of the fields will be massive. So in particular, the component of phi, which is fixed, uh, that will be massive. And uh, in particular, we'll make massive also one component of the gauge field by Higgs mechanism. Um, and so for massive fields, the one-loop determinant just uh, is equal to 1, and you can remove it. Um, essentially, because as we discussed various times, this expression is independent of the RG scale of the gauge coupling. And so you expect that everything which is very massive does not contribute. Um, so, okay, here you have to believe in my essentially the one-loop determinant is the one that we already computed. You just remove the fields that uh, get a valve. Uh, so the interesting part that you would like to understand is these, uh, these guys here. Um, so, 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 so what are these guys? Well, this is uh, precisely uh, the result of... Uh, well, it contains two factors. So this is the result of the integration of the vortex modular space and also contains a piece of the classical action that depends on this vortex number. So somehow here I have uh, taken out uh, everything that does not depend on this vortex number, so this contribution here, uh, and, and what the still depends on this k is contained in, this, uh, in these pieces. So... Um, so what this z-vortex is, um, so, so essentially, if you want, this is the integral. Uh, so as you said, this is the integral on this uh, modular space. So it's essentially its, uh, its volume. Uh, and this is weighted by uh, a factor, which is the vortex action, uh, which depends on this k. Now, if you do things a little bit more carefully, you discover that, in fact, uh, the action close to the pulse is not just um, uh, the flat action, because there is still some curvature. And uh, because of this curvature, the, the action looks like the theory in the omega background. So really, this vortex partition function corresponds to vortices in the omega background. And what is this omega background? Well, I'm just going to give you some words, because uh, I don't have time to go into full details. But essentially, this omega background gives you some potential, some trapping potential that keeps uh, the vortices around the origin. Because if you're studying vortices in R2, and this is the same with the, with the instantons, uh, now, OK, we're looking at the modular space of these vortices, and these vortices are some lamps of, uh, of uh, energy or, or action, more precisely. Uh, but they can move. And in particular, they can go to infinity. And so this modular space is non-compact, and it has infinite volume. Um, so what the omega background does is to uh, add some trapping potential uh, such that these vortices can still move, but there is some cost in action, and so at the end of the day, they are all trapped in the, in the middle. 
And so this, uh, somehow the volume of this modular space becomes finite. Uh, I'm a bit confused. Is, I thought that these vortices only contribute to, to the, in the point, in the north and south pole, or is that not true? That is not completely correct in the sense that, as I said, so here I'm writing the equation in the limit in which this chi goes to infinity, but when chi is finite, you, you have some smooth equation on the sphere, and these smooth equations uh, essentially allow only the vortices around the point, but not just at the point. So, the, the, the so, so in some region which scales with uh, uh, inverse chi? Depends on chi, it also depends on r. And so uh, if you write down the action, it looks like around the point, which is what matters in the limit chi to infinity, it looks like the omega background. So in R2, you need the omega background. But on the sphere, it's just done automatically by this Q exact term. Um, uh, and as I say, this should be the equivalent of the story of Pestum on S4 if you do the non-commutative uh, deformation. But that has not been done. Okay. Um, okay. So essentially, we have to compute this um, the volume of this of the modular space of uh, vortices in the omega background, uh, weighted by essentially the classical action of of, of the vortex, uh, k times the classical action of the vortex, and so this object here will be a sum over the vortex numbers, uh, which are positive. And then this, this Q is the weight associated to the, to the, that comes from the classical action. So it's a uh, power of the, I mean, there's one factor for each vortex. And then we have the integral over the modular space of K vortices. And this, uh, so this is essentially the volume. However, the volume is infinite because it's non-compact. And uh, uh, what this potential does is to transform this volume form in the equivariant volume form, uh, such that now this, this, this is finite. And so what this Q is, well, this Q uh, is e to the minus 4 psi minus i theta. Um, so, um, so, um, yes, so in the instanton, so in the case of instantons, the instanton action depends on the gauge, inverse gauge coupling in the theta angle. In two dimensions, what plays that role is the theta angle and this Fayetiliopoulos parameter. Okay, so this just comes from integrating the uh, classical action on this, on this background. Sorry, equivariant under what? What's, what's the group action? Yes, I'm going to describe. Is there some k factorial in the denominator? Typically, mm. yes, there's a, you don't want to overcount. Yeah, I mean, here you have to count the volume of the modular space where you okay, keep, so uh, you don't okay. overcount. So it's not just, uh, I mean, this volume is not just k times the volume of a single, uh, because they also interact. I mean, they can, there are rota relative rotations and. But okay, at infinity, if you wish, you could. Uh, it would look like a orbifold. Uh, maybe. Well, okay, I don't want to say things I'm not sure about. Okay, so what about this modular space? Um, so this modular space is is scalar. Uh, it's not hyperscalar as the instant of modular space, but it still is scalar. Uh, and in particular, it's symplectic. So the scalar form is a symplectic form. And so there is a symplectic form, omega is a two form, and it's closed. And uh, um, if you take uh, the maximal possible power of this omega, I give you the volume form. However, if we say the volume, so, so, so we could try to take to, to the volume will be equal to uh, will be equal to omega to the power. So let's so this this is is scalar and symplectic. So the dimension uh, of this space is two L. 
Uh, and, uh, okay, we could determine what this L in terms of K and the gauge group, but, okay, I don't remember the formula, but it's even. So the volume form will be this, uh, but as you say, this, this volume is infinite, so we don't want to in com compute this because this is just going to be infinite. Um, and so, uh, but in fact, what you have to compute is the equivariant volume. So equivalent with respect to what? Uh, so first of all, we have rotations of R2. Uh, and moreover, we have uh, uh, flavor rotations. Right, so in this equation, we have this phi, which transforms in some... Uh, in some, uh, um, I mean, under some flavor group, and so we have flavor rotations. And so, okay, this is already a billion. In the flavor rotations uh, group, we take the, the maximal torus, um, and, uh, and we do the equivariant, uh, and, and so we, we want to do equivariant um, cohomology, if you want. Uh, under the maximal torus in here, so the, the yeah, the maximal torus. Good, good question. Is A L equal to K for the K? No, uh, I mean, as I say, it depends on uh, the gauge group, uh, and it depends on uh, the... Yes. Um, yes. And so it depends on the gauge group and on the uh, representation of phi. So here I'm being very general. Uh, as you will see, I mean, the example that we consider, I mean, if phi, phi will be in the fundamental, but you could consider uh, any, any representation. Uh, for sure there is a formula, I just don't know. Okay, so we have these two guys, and so for each of these guys we should introduce a vector field. And now, once again, since I don't have much time, let me just keep the discussion uh, in the notation light, so let's call V uh, the various vector fields. Really, there is one vector field for each of the U1s, so we should introduce our parameters for these vector fields, or more precisely, one should make these vector fields taking values in, in the algebra, in the Cartan algebra. Uh, we have not done this properly in the first lecture, but okay. I mean, of course, if you are interested, you can take, for instance, this uh, lecture of uh, Alexeev or any other review, and you, you can see the details. So we just write V. Uh, and now what happens that, uh, um, okay, so first of all, this volume form is uh, invariant, so is equivariant un under, under this action, essentially because this is a symmetry of the problem. However, it's not equivalently closed. And so we construct, um, we construct uh, the equivalent volume form. Oh, let me say that we can also write this as e to the omega restricted to the top component. Um, and so this equivalent volume form is just equal to e to the omega plus uh, mu, where omega is the very same uh, sympathetic form we had before, but now mu is the moment map <coughs> for, this, uh, for this U1 action. So what is a moment map? But well, a moment map is a function, and as I say more precisely, it should take value in the, alg in the Cartan algebra of the, of the group that acts. But we will pretend that it's just... So if you want, what we say is just, you can think that we just do equivalent with respect to R2 in this, in this discussion here. And so what uh, this does, uh, so the differential of mu, which is a one form, is, uh, must be equal to the contraction of the symplectic form by V. So this is the equation that uh, you impose, and the function that satisfies this equation is a moment map. So this moment map exists if you have a U1 action and we have a symplectic uh, manifold. Uh, yes, and in fact, uh, yes. Okay. So you can think of this as a Hamiltonian, if you want, in the a rational mechanics context as a Hamiltonian for this uh, time evolution. 
And, uh, and now you can check that this is equivalently closed uh, with respect to our uh, equivalent differential. And so, uh, and so we can use this uh, uh, equivalent volume form to uh, define uh, the equivalent volume. And the integral of this uh, will, will be finite. Maybe to slow you down a bit, this okay. moment map, yes. uh, I mean, in Volker's uh, uh, lecture, we show that uh, this is basically the triplet measure from the hypermultiplet in four dimensions. Uh -huh. How should I understand it a little bit more? Uh, well, here there is no triplet, there is no SU2. Yes. Uh, we are not in the hyperkeller hyper context, we are just in the Keller context. Um, I don't understand the question. No, no, I'm just trying to understand it a little bit more in terms of uh, fields, rather than, because, okay, you said that it's a Keller's inflective manifold, blah, 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 but mm -hmm. where does it come from? Uh, can I understand it in terms of uh, the Higgs branch physics a little bit? Uh, no. hmm, probably yes, surely yes. <laughs> but uh, okay, I don't know right now. I mean, I will give you the HM construction in a moment, so maybe it will be more clear. Uh, but uh, I mean, from the mathematical or even physical point of view, um, so first of all, this moment map is fixed once you have the, so if you have the U and action, and you have the symplectic form, this equation fixes mu up to a constant, and this constant is not important. And uh, as I say, just uh, from the point of view of this modular space, you can think of it as a, um, as a, a Hamiltonian. Um, and, uh, and in fact, this, and, and, and this, so Hamiltonian for this action, uh, and in fact, the, um, the motion of this action will be at constant uh, mu. So if you want this u1 action, so sometimes this is called a height function, because if you have some space, so OK. By the way, one exercise. Is to compute that the equivariant volume uh, of uh, uh, C so just R2, okay, just a complex plane, is uh, uh, 1 over epsilon. So this if you do this exercise, maybe you, you clarify better these uh, concepts. But OK, suppose that, so, so essentially, if you have some manifold, um, suppose that you have S2. So it will not be, be that, that uh, example, but of course very close. And your U1 action is. Uh, rotation of the S2, then the moment map would be literally the height in this picture, or the Z component if you embed in, uh, in R3. Uh, and then this motion is, a, so you can think of a, of a map of mountains, uh, you know, there are these lines of uh, equal height, and precisely the UN action will be along these lines of equal height. Um, which means that this is a conserved quantity along the flow generated by, by V. Okay, this probably doesn't answer to your question, but... <laughs> so, for example, you know a fundamental model and not a fundamental. It, it's going to be like a Q squared minus Q tilde squared. Absolutely. It's one of the three of the... Uh, yeah, I think it is the D-term equation. Yeah, so is it different from the D-term? So, uh, yeah, I think it is the D term, but okay. uh, uh, so to be hundred percent sure, as you think about it, but uh, because I guess in Wolfian case it was uh, the D term and the this, this complex D term, which is an F term, right? right. There's triplet, right. so yeah, it's probably the D term. Okay. What is the parameter epsilon in your exercise? So okay, so we are doing uh, so we want to compute the equivalent volume of C. So we do, uh, so with respect to rotations, um, okay, maybe I should say it, but, um, well, it's the only U1 action. And, uh, um, yes, and then in the first lecture, we say that if you want to make uh, things homogeneous, 
uh, we should uh, introduce a parameter epsilon in front of uh, the contraction with v. So if you want, it's a parameter that we need to insert here. Um, and then this is the epsilon that will appear there. Yeah, sorry. Otherwise, you will get one. I think. Uh, yes. Essentially, I mean, it depends how you parameterize v. Uh, what is the the length of the circle? Okay, so maybe here in this exercise we can say that we use d. Uh, maybe I had a minus in my. No, thanks. Okay. So now that we can get a, so so this defines a finite uh, volume for this space. Um, and, and so now, uh, now what we would like to compute is this. And in order to do this integral, I will take a physicist approach. Uh, I will not do it mathematically, but essentially what we can use is uh, the ADHM construction that uh, Wolfger explained. So this integral will be uh, the zero-dimensional path integral. Uh, so essentially it's a matrix model. Uh, of a theory whose moduli space is precisely the moduli space that we want to compute the volume of. So that has uh, this space. As its uh, moduli space. Um, and uh, this, this trick, uh, this, this way of computing it, is, is called ADHM construction. Of course, ADHM didn't precisely do this. I mean, they were ma mathematicians and they did it uh, in a mathematical way. So you want this is a physicist interpretation of DHM construction. Okay, um, so you already saw essentially how it works in uh, Bolsker's uh, lecture. Uh, and so, um, and now, uh, of course, the problem here is that we need to know what this theory is. And this is not, there is no algorithm to do that as far as I know. And so one can discuss some examples in which we know the ADHM construction, uh, but we cannot apply it in general if you don't know the ADHM construction. The same uh, comment applies to instantons, of course. There is no nice brain picture here that you can always follow? Uh, that you can always follow? No. Uh, there are uh, in, in, uh, well, examples. Usually you can, uh, so ADHM, ADHM doesn't use uh, the brain construction, but uh, it can be reinterpreted with brains. And you, I think that all the examples for which we know the ADHM construction, we also know the brain derivation. Uh, <coughs> but as you know, if I give you a generic group and generic uh, representation, we don't have a brain construction. So that's, uh, that's a problem. So OK, so let me consider then a specific example. Uh, and so we take u a, uh, u n, super q c d. So this will be the 2D theory. Okay? So this is the 2D theory of which we want to understand the vortex moduli space. Okay? So the 2D theory is u n super q c d with n f fundamentals and uh, n f tilde anti fundamentals. <coughs> and uh, uh, we take nf bigger or equal to n and generic nf tilde. 
So this is the 2D theory, which uh, uh, is one of, uh, so uh, a special case uh, was uh, this exercise that uh, Bruno gave, gave you. Now you had U1 with, I think, two fundamentals, 20 fundamentals. Okay, and so, um, okay, of this theory, we would like to understand the vortex moduli space, and one can have uh, a brain construction, first of all, for the theory, then you need a brain construction for the vortices in this theory, and then you read off what is the theory uh, on the object that realizes the, the vortices. And this was done by, uh, was done by Anani and Tong. And so, uh, so okay, so now we go to the K vortex sector. And I will give you the answer. So this would be a Z, so this was a 2D, 2, 2, theory. And so the, 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 the zero dimensional theory, whose modular space is the vortex modular space in this theory. So this is a zero dimensional theory which is the dimensional reduction of uh, to the uh, 0, 0,2. So if you want, this is a theory with two real supercharges. Um, I don't know if we should call it n equal 2. Uh, but essentially, it's dimensional reduction of this. And it contains the following, um, the following ingredients. So there is a UK vector. Um, okay, let me give names to these fields. I don't know if this is important or not. Let's see. Then there is one adjoint chiral. Uh, that I call X and chi. So this is a scalar, fermion, fermion, scalar. This scalar fermion. <laughs> then there are N fundamental chiral. There are NF minus N anti-fundamental chiral. And then there are NF tilde fundamental Fermi. And uh, a Fermi multiplet starts with a scalar, uh, starts with a fermion, and then it contains an auxiliary field, which is a scalar. Uh, so in particular, notice that uh, uh, in this theory, the gauge group is not the gauge group that you are in 2D. Somehow the gauge group depends on the number of vortices. Uh, it does not depend on the gauge group that you have here, but this is okay. This is a different theory. This is a zero dimensional theory, which you, you want is precisely constructed in such a way that if you compute the modular space of this theory, it's equal to the modular space of solutions to the vortex equation. Okay? Uh, it's a non trivial fact. Um, no one can check, or one can use a brain construction. Uh, but okay, I will not go into the full details. I just want to give an, an example. Can you comment on this um, asymmetry between an F and an F tilde? In this, uh, and is there maybe some cyber dual to this? Uh, yes, why there is this asymmetry? Well, because uh, there is a Fayette Iliopoulos here, um, Xi. And uh, I have chosen an f bigger or equal to n, but yeah, this is something I should have said. I'm choosing psi to be, I think, positive. Um, so this construction is for positive Fayetilopoulos term. So the focus of the term is essential to have uh, vortices. Uh, and since this is real, there is a uh, there is a transition, right? Because at zero is a special point. You can distinguish positive or negative, so this is for positive. And, uh, and so, so in particular, when Xi is positive, you see essentially the fundamental fields are the ones that 
can take the uh, expectation value because the, the, the D term equation is phi phi dagger minus, uh, well, or chi. Uh, so let me call it psi here. Uh, so this is the D term equation. Uh, and so in particular, if, if uh, well, and here, but here you have the charge of the field, really. In the, in the D term equation, here you have the charge of the field. Um, and so if the Fayetilopoulos is, is positive, then positively charged fields can get an expectation value, uh, which is the situation I described here. If it is negative, it's the opposite. Yes. OK. So you have this nice construction. And then, uh, um, and so essentially, uh, the, the, the way to compute this, this uh, equivalent volume is to do the path integral of this theory. The path integral of this theory computes for us the equivalent volume. So uh, how do we compute the path integral of this? OK, first of all, this is a matrix model. So mm, it's, it's um, simple. Uh, but OK, uh, in fact, we can apply, once again, the localization but now to this problem uh, in instead of the big problem, right? So this is somehow the idea that I would like to convey, that we started with a path integral of the 2D theory. Uh, we apply localization to that. This involves some modular space, which is complicated. You have to compute its volume, but we have a description of it in terms of a lower dimensional theory, and now we apply localization to this theory. Um, Of course, the localization of a zero-dimensional path integral at the end of the day uh, is essentially equivalent localization. Um. That we discussed in the first lecture. Um, and so, um, I, again, I'm not going into the, into the full details. But essentially, what do we have to do? Well, we have to uh, compute the one-loop determinants. Uh, I mean, we'll have to solve uh, the BPS equations and compute classical action and one-loop determinants. Uh, for instance, one-loop determinants are very simple because uh, well, we are in zero dimensions. So for instance, suppose that they take a chiral multiplet. Uh, now in this chiral multiplet, there is this x uh, that I had here, and there is chi. Uh, however, in the action, there are no derivatives. This is zero dimensional. It's, a, it's just a matrix model. And so for instance, the piece, uh, the quadratic action for them is just this. Uh, why is this? So it is quadratic in the fields, but once again, there are no derivatives. Uh, this action is just dimensional reduction of this theory. Uh, but there is a mass term which is controlled by the uh, well, scalar in the vector multiple. Of course, in the vector multiple, there is no vector. We are in zero dimensions. So there is only the scalar. Uh, but the scalar is a sort of twisted mass, right? It is, uh, it's in two dimensions. So the, if you take the scalar and plug into the action. So if you want, this is the dimension. When you do the dimensional reduction from two dimensions, uh, the twisted, the, you're left with the twisted mass, which is what this is. Uh, but, but this is an, uh, a Gaussian integral that uh, you, you can do. So you get 1 over 5 squared from this. You get 5 from this. And so this may be up to some constants and are not important. It's just 1 over 5. Um, so you can think of this as the one loop determinant for the Carroll multiplet. And so, um, um, and so you go through all the steps. Uh, you have to do the, uh, the gauge fixing, and you have to do everything uh, carefully. And uh, um, let me write the result. And we'll not explain exactly how to get to these results, because um, it's, um, so that is what I wanted to explain in the um, second part of the, of the lecture. So the final result is that you get some integral along some contour.
And so, uh, so essentially, this is once again the flavor of the. I mean, this follow the general discussion that we have. So we have contribution from the one-loop determinants of all the fields. <coughs> it turns out that there is no classical action in this particular problem. And then we have to integrate somehow over the BPS configuration that I have not described, and what you obtain is some contour integral uh, in this uh, in this space. And I'm not going to explain this right now because this is, as I said, something that I want to explain. A, in a different context in a, in a moment. Um, so uh, yes, so let me just say that this contour, uh, I mean a contour integral is essentially a residue, um, and so this contour is called the Jeffrey Kiman residue. Okay, and we will see in a moment um, what this is and how it arises. So since I didn't give you any detail, uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's useful at this point that I describe what are the fixed points and so on. Um, but OK, one can do this, and one can, one can get some expression. So maybe let me just write the final expression. And, uh, um, and I write the final expression just because you, you, you had an exercise. So you maybe want to compare with the exercise. Can you explain what are M and M tilde? Uh, so those are uh, masses. Yeah, so I didn't explain essentially anything. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so... Um, so these equivariant parameters, they appear as ma uh, twisted masses in this ADHM construction. And uh, well, you saw the same thing, I guess, with the case of instantons. So in particular, this adjoint chiral is massive. And as has a mass, so if you want the U1 action that rotates spacetime, that rotates uh, this R2, corresponds to a U1 that rotates this chiral. Because the expectation value of this chiral, roughly speaking, describes the position of the of the vortex. It has many components. It's in the joint, so it has k. When you, once you diagonalize it, the k's components, and so each component describes the position of one of the vortices. Uh, and so rotating spacetime corresponds to rotating this guy. So there is a U1 action here, and to each U1 action you can associate a twisted mass, and so this mass is epsilon. Um, and then there are the flavor rotations, and the flavor rotations uh, act on these uh, chirals and Fermi multiplets. And so these guys here have masses m with an index, and these guys here have masses uh, that I called m tilde. And uh, when you connect this problem with the two-dimensional problem, uh, this, uh, this epsilon has to be fixed to 1 over r, the radius of the sphere. Uh, that is because I told you that if you look at the action very close to the pole, you see that it looks like that you're in the omega background. And what plays the role of epsilon is curvature. Uh, and these guys here are precisely corresponds to the twisted masses that you had originally in this theory. OK, so um, so, um, so, okay, so one does this uh, procedure of computing these residues. Very good. Is this expression independent from, independent of chi? Yes. Because you sent it to infinity? Uh, mm. Not the second I mean, guy now. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand which guy. Uh, yes, why is that? Well, because uh, so we are looking at the vortex modular space, um, and uh, um, 
I mean, what we are, co okay, what we are computing is this, uh, let's see if I still have the expression, no, I don't have the, okay, I just erased the, probably the expression. So the expression that we have in 2D is, so there was, so we are looking at ZS2, right? This is the guy that we are trying to compute in a different way. And this was, okay, there was this sum over Higgs branches. There was, um, there was uh, this, this, this classical action, this one loop, uh, and then there was the z-vortex and z-anti-vortex. Okay? And now we are trying to compute this z-vortex. Uh, we know that chi, is, it was in an a a q-exact term, so chi is not going to affect the answer. Uh, so it should not, so this z-v should not depend on it. Uh, in fact, what I say is z-v is the equivalent volume of the vortex module space. And this equivalent volume, uh, well, it depends on the equivalent parameters. So it depends on epsilon and this m. Um, it does not depend on, uh, on, uh, on chi. If you want chi is, uh, well, in the vortex equation you have a chi, uh, but that module space does not depend uh, at least. It's, its equivalent volume does not depend on it. Okay, so at the end of the day, you get some expression that, uh, once again, the details are not important. i will just writing it um, because uh, you will be able to compare in your exercise. So, okay, so this will be the, so we do this computation for each k, and then, as I wrote at, at some point, then we have to sum over k, right? We have all these vortex sectors, and we have to sum over them. So, let, so here, this will be the sum over all the vectors. And uh, in general, if you have uh, many components for the gauge group, um, when we break, when you go to the x branch, it's broken to a bunch of u1s. Uh, these are the um, numbers in each of the, the vortex number in each of the directions. But okay, this will arise from doing that computation, in particular looking what are the BPS solutions that I didn't describe. But so one gets some expression. Okay, let me write it. Uh, not sure. So in this expression, so this expression depends on epsilon, depends on these twisted masses. And uh, uh, these objects here are the Pokamer symbols. Uh, so in particular, these are some finite products. There is a lot of notation that I have not explained here. And, uh, so there is a lot of notation. Probably is, is, there is no point for me to explain everything. So let me just make some comments. So what does this depend on? So it depends on epsilon and it depends on these masses. Now there is also this, this dependence on Q, but this comes when we sum over the vortex num or the vortex sectors, right? Because we say that uh, there are vortex sectors that are weighted by the vortex action, and so only when we resum we get this contribution here. Uh, these Pokamer symbols, they are essentially products, finite products. And so this expression is relatively simple. There is just uh, some number of monomials in these various parameters above, and some number of monomials below, and some rational function, and you have to do this series, and essentially this is a hypergeometric series. It's a higher dimensional version of it, but essentially this is a hypergeometric function. So once again, it's a relatively simple object. 
And uh, uh, why I'm writing this? So first of all, because in your exercise, uh, so you had to compute this S2 partition function by doing some residue, yeah, some summing, some, some, some residues. And, uh, and so you, you want to compare with this, uh, with this expression. Uh, but so the, the, the point that I want to stress is that, uh, so we started yesterday, so yesterday we obtained some expression for this two partition function, there was this Coulomb branch formula. This Coulomb branch formula essentially was a sum over some magnetic fluxes, and it was an integral over some uh, uh, real lines of some in, 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 uh, integrand. And now, uh, well, so yesterday and today we found uh, an alternative formula doing the localization in a different way, which is this X branch uh, formula. So this is a Coulomb branch uh, formula. And now we found some uh, uh, different expression in which there was this finite sum. Uh, and then in here we had up to some uh, classical one loop terms we have this uh, z vortex and this z anti vortex. So this formula looks very different, uh, but they should be equal because we are just uh, computing the same path integral in two different ways. And in fact, one can, at least in this example, uh, check very explicitly that these are the same, precisely doing what uh, I described yesterday and, and you are supposed to do in the exercise. So you start with this integral, which is along a, uh, then you close the, the contour on one of the two sides, and which side depends on the value of the Fayette-Heliopoulos term, in such a way that the contribution here is, is zero. Uh, and then you have to sum over the poles, and as I described, there is uh, some la wedge of a lattice of poles, so you have to sum over all these residues, and if you do that, you discover that each of these residues is precisely one of the terms in this sum. Uh, of course, there is a double sum because you have vortex and anti-vortex. So this double sum precisely corresponds to this, the fact that this lattice has two directions. And each of the terms uh, in here corresponds to one of the terms, well, this times the, the, the other term in here. And so this you can do very explicitly, and you can check that this is really true. Uh, at least in, the, in a, an example in which you know how to compute this explicitly, and this super QCD example is one such example. Okay. What happens if you take a, su a pure super mills? In that case, there is no heat strike, so I don't expect any heat strike localization, but you can still cross the contour for Coulomb, right? Uh, let's see, pure super mills. Uh. So, uh, let's see, don't you break supersymmetry? Uh, I think you get zero. Uh, in fact, the, the constraint that I put there, that the number of flavors is equal uh, or larger than n, is in such a way that you get something non-zero. Otherwise, you get zero. Because you break super symmetry. Just the phi i minus phi j, etc. I see. So you don't even have a pole. It's not. It's, it, maybe it's divergent or zero. Ah, uh, it's zero. Zero. Okay. I see. Um. I see. So when and if it's not large enough, it's always zero. Then maybe even if you have say add one flavor p x three. Yeah, you see it, uh, uh, no, it's, it's easy to see it. So the point is that we are studying the theory at positive phi at Heliopoulos. And uh, uh, so let's say we do S, uh, you are doing uh, U, UN. So if you're doing UN at positive phi at Heliopoulos, uh, there is just no solution. Uh, we go on flat space. We study the Lorentzian theory on flat space. Uh, there is no solution to do the D term equation. OK. Um, so yeah, so this. Uh, so what this computation shows, uh, uh, besides the fact that it's interesting that we can write this in two different ways, is that in fact this formula that we wrote, that apparently didn't contain the instantons because this was just classical in one loop, and you might say, okay, there is just an integral here. Uh, but in fact, it does contain all the instanton corrections, 
uh, which are uh, manifest in this other um, way of writing the partition function. Um, so the, the dimension of the lattice you sum over would depend on the rank of the vector, right? Yes, yeah, so this is for u1. So, so this was for u. Essentially, for each of these integrations, you, you have this. Uh, sorry, how u1 should be u2 then? Or it's what? a two dimensional lattice, so that's rank 2? Yeah, so if, you have, so if your 2D theory is u1, like it was in the exercise, then this integral is a single integral, it's only integral of dA. So you really have just one line. And then when you close the contour, you get this two-dimensional lattice. So where does it come from? One of the directions of the lattice comes from this sum. And the other comes from the fact that the integrand was uh, a ratio of gamma functions. But uh, uh, so gamma function does not have zeros, so you don't get poles from zeros here, but you get poles from poles here. And gamma function has, has poles for uh, when the argument is uh, ne zero or negative integer. So that gives you the other direction. Well, you have to combine them. But. If, if you do the exercise, you will see how it works. OK. So this concludes what I wanted to say about this. Um, are there any other questions? OK. So in the second part, so I wanted to talk about uh, um, elliptic genus and how one gets this uh, thing here. I don't have much time, so probably uh, I mean, I will just give you some ideas. Uh, I have half an hour. So. So, um, so, so far we talked about, uh, so I want to remain in the same uh, context. So I want to remain into 2D n equal 2 comma 2 theories, gauge theories. And uh, uh, so, so far we discussed this untwisted S2. So it was just one example. Uh, but as I described, there are other backgrounds um, which, uh, that one can use to preserve supersymmetry and compute things about this very same theory. And these other backgrounds will give us access to other observables. And so in particular, one interesting example is to take T2 and compute this partition function of T2. And, uh, um, and this is interesting for two reasons. So first of all, it's interesting because okay, we compute something about these two-dimensional theories. Um, and for instance, if this is a sector of the string, uh, we compute something about the string theory and so on. It's also interesting because in doing this computation, we will get an example in which we have fermion zero modes. Uh, and it turns out that the system of zero modes that one obtained in this, in this example appears in many other examples. So learning how to deal with the system of zero modes, one learns how to do many other examples. Um, Maybe the supersymmetry can be lower, right? Yes, so the setup in which one can do this uh, is uh, 2d n equals 0, 0,2. So it's uh, a special case. Uh, so with this lower amount of supersymmetry, still everything I will say works. Uh, I just prefer to do it here because we already discussed the multiplets and the actions. I don't want to introduce more notation and stuff. Uh, but everything works essentially the same. Um, so yeah, there is no point in doing this. There is nothing really new that one learns, I think. Um, so, 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 um, so, what, so first of all, what is the object that, uh, that we are computing? So we said as we change the manifold, we get access to different observables. So what are the observables that we obtain if we study the theory on T2? Well, this is a super conformal index. And so essentially now we make contact with what uh, Guido described yesterday and the day before. He was talking about an index in four dimension n equal to one. And he describes what an index is. You can either count states on the sphere or operators in flat space. Uh, and this is the very same story in two dimensions. 
So we can think of, so we can write this index. This is called the elliptic genus. Uh, but in fact, it's a super conformal index in two dimensions. Um, and this will be a function of various parameters uh, or chemical potential. So what this is, well, instead of putting the theory on, on a, well, we put the theory on a sphere, but since we are in two dimensions, the spatial sphere is just the circle. So we put the theory on a circle. If you want, we have this ceiling there. So this is uh, an S1. And uh, now we have two sectors. So we go in the Ramon-Ramon sector. Uh, so periodic boundary condition for fermions. Uh, now we want to compute a protected index. So we put minus one to the fermion number. And then we start, uh, well, we count states. This is a trace over the Hilbert space. So it's a sum over the states in the Hilbert space. And we put weights for these states. And so um, now we have, uh, so of course we have Hamiltonian and uh, uh, momentum along S1. And it us it's useful in two dimensions to rewrite them as left-moving Hamiltonian and right-moving Hamiltonians. Uh, so, uh, so we can have two weights that they call Q and Q bar for a left-moving Hamiltonian and right-moving Hamiltonian. Now, since we are in 2,2, uh, so we need to preserve some supersymmetry if you want to construct an index. Uh, but here we have, uh, so I will also insist, so I will insist on theories that have full R symmetry. So for instance, uh, super conformal theories like here. And so the symmetry is u1 left times u1 right. So now we'll use the full R symmetry. I will insist that there is the full R symmetry. And in order to compute this index, I only need to preserve one half, uh, as is apparent from the fact that uh, it would work in this context. So, uh, so the other one, I can uh, turn on a fugacity for this, and I can do a refinement and um, weight states according to what is the R charge uh, here. So this is this other, uh, OK. But so let me write it. Essentially, this, uh, well, these are the chemical potentials, and these are the fugacities. Uh, this is standard. And then there will be some psi A. And then the theory in general can have some flavor symmetry that commutes with the supercharges. And so we can uh, um, put fugacities for these uh, flavor symmetries. Um, so this is the object that we can try to define. And, uh, uh, but this object has some nice properties. So first of all, it does not depend on Q bar. And the argument is the standard uh, Witten uh, argument that if you have a state whose right-moving Hamiltonian is, is above zero, then uh, there must be a, so we use the supercharges and we construct a partner of the state which has all the same quantum numbers because all these other uh, operators commute with the right-moving Hamiltonian but, but the fermion number since these are partners opposite uh, statistics. And so we get another contribution, which is all the same, but for the sign. And so the two cancels. Um, and, uh, um, and, uh, and so only the states for which hr is equal to 0 can contribute to this index. And so in particular means that there is no dependence on q bar. Uh, now, the same argument does not work for the left-moving uh, Hamiltonian because now we are also waging the, the state by the left-moving R symmetry. And so when we act with the left, if you have a state with non-zero left-moving Hamiltonian, we act with the supercharges, we get the partner, but the partner will have a different R charge, and so now the two things do not cancel. And this is why there is actual dependence on Q. Okay? Is this point clear? 
So it does not depend on Q bar, it depends on Q. So in particular, it's holomorphic function or meromorphic or analytic uh, of Q uh, or, or of tau. So this is something which is interesting. Uh, of course, we can send uh, y to 1, and then we remove this parameter. And then if we don't have this parameter, we can apply the same argument. So there is also not dependence on Q bar, on, on Q. And in fact, this reduces to a number, um, which is the Witten index. So now we are just really counting ground states of the system on, uh, on, on S1, where uh, both are, are, are 0. Um, and so, um, okay, so these are nice properties, and let me stress, so what this means is that uh, what, what we are counting are some special states whose uh, L0, L0 bar quantum numbers are P0. So we are counting, so in terms of, um, so if we think of doing um, uh, radial quantization, and to relate the sum over states to a sum over operators in flat space, we are counting essentially holomorphic operators. Operators whose, uh, that only have, uh, if you want, who dimension is equal to the spin. Uh, or, in other words, the, the right moving Hamiltonian is, is, is zero. Okay, any, any question? Maybe the Ramon Ramon is new now that we are into the. And it would be good to Okay. Uh, well, essentially, uh, so we are on the circle. Oh, well, we are on the ceiling there. And uh, um, so here we are studying the theory on the ceiling there. And uh, uh, well, there are, uh, there are uh, uh, two spin structures on the, on the ceiling there, uh, Ramond or uh, Neve Schwartz. Uh, I mean, this just amounts to the fact we have to specify is fermions are periodic or anti periodic. And here we are taking the, the Ramond sector. So we are taking uh, periodic fermions. But if we take the other one, what are we counting? Yeah, so in general, we cannot take the other one. So if you're doing 0, 2, we cannot. And the reason is, and this is a general fact, um, I mean, we want to preserve supersymmetry. So if we have multiplets with bosons and fermions, we want that uh, uh, all fields in the multiplet be behaving in the same way. So as we go around the circle, we want that all the fields have the same boundary conditions. And if you are taking periodic boundaries for the condition for scalars, then we should also take periodic boundary condition for fermions. So if you want, Ramond is the natural, uh, is the natural uh, boundary condition that, that you have to choose in a, in a, in a Witten index. Uh, the other one, in general, will correspond to some thermal or, or well, this is not the, I mean, this is not the time circle, but. Uh, now, 2 comma 2 is special because there is more supersymmetry, and in fact, the two choices, Ramon, Ramon, and Emil Schwartz, and Emil Schwartz, are related by spectral flow. Um, now, I'm not going to explain spectral flow. <laughs> you can take Polchinski. Uh, but the upshot is that you, you can compute the one in the Neville Schwartz sector, but the two are just related by a redefinition of the variables. Uh, essentially, you have, yeah, you just shift uh, the, the chemical potentials, uh, and, and this rep reproduces one in terms of the other. So there is no new information if you compute the one in uh, Neville Schwartz sector. Okay. Any other question? This has been in the two point place, the spectral flow should, uh, should be applied separately on the left and over on the right and the right. Then why there's no spectral flow in the Well, I mean, if you have, uh, let's see, I mean, if you have uh, an actual theory where, uh, you know, imposed that the spin is quantized. Uh, then you apply, you have the spectral flow in, uh, I mean, just in the combined direction, I think. Yeah. No, I mean, in 2 comma 2 case, you can apply changing the spin of the fermion 
uh, uh, separately from the holomorphic one and holomorphic part. Well, but the full states are really a combination of some left-moving part and some uh, right-moving part. So if you want something which is well-defined in the full theory, okay. uh, I think you do have to do it uh, simultaneously. Okay, um, so this is an interesting object, and the point is that uh, this object, which here is written as a trace of a some Hilbert space, can be computed by a path integral. And this is a standard, uh, standard statement that if you want to compute, so if you, want some, if you have some manifold, and you want to compute states on this manifold, what you do, you go to Euclidean, so this is Lorentzian, and this is time, and you want to compute states of the theory on this spatial manifold, what you can do, you go to Euclidean, uh, you take the same manifold, uh, but then you compactify time. So uh, now this is an S1, and, uh, and so the path integral of, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, Euclidean compact manifold is counting for you the number of states on, um, on this spatial manifold. Um, and so in particular, so we can compute this index by putting the theory on T2, because we already have a spatial circle, we have to make the other cycle a long time, and we get a T2. Um, now when we do that, how do uh, all these fugacities appear? Well, the fugacities for, uh, for left-moving and right-moving Hamiltonian, they precisely correspond to the fact that, uh, well, okay, in general we have a fugacity for the Hamiltonian, and they just correspond to the size of the circle, okay, because the path integral in this setup, this is computing a partition function. So this is a sum over all the energies of e to the minus beta h, well, of all, 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 all the states. Uh, but here we also have, uh, on S1, we also have a momentum, um, and so uh, one can reorganize the sum over energy and momentum into uh, left-moving Hamiltonian and right-moving Hamiltonian. If you want, it's just, just a sum over L0 and L0 bar. The other fugacities will appear as some uh, um, flat connections for uh, vector multiplets. So now we have our T2. And on T2, there are two cycles. And so every time we have a symmetry, we can couple uh, the current to an external vector multiplet, and we can turn on a flat connection for this vector multiplet, for this vector. Um, so in particular, we can impose that, uh, so we can fix, yeah, we can fix the integral of this uh, flat connection along uh, each cycle of the torus. And so one can introduce some complex parameters. For instance, the parameter z that appears there will be nothing else that uh, the, the Wilson line for the vector uh, field for the R symmetry along, say, the temporal cycle minus tau of uh, the integral along the space uh, cycle. Um, and so turning on these two parameters, which are real, one gets a complex variable and this complex variable corresponds to, to this chemical potential. Okay, this is, uh, this is standard. So, so what are these vector fields that for the R system? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, in the index, we argue that what we can do and still have a protected index is a weight for the left-moving R symmetry and a weight for flavor symmetries. Mm -hmm. So this corresponds to the fact that if you go on the torus, we can turn on, so if you want this is the left moving R symmetry, we can turn on a Wilson line for a background gauge field that caps to the left moving R symmetry. And this does not spoil the right moving R symmetry. Uh, and then we can do a similar thing for the flavor, uh, for the flavor symmetries. So similarly, new A will be equal to the integral or some flavor A along the temporal cycle, minus tau. Hmm. Okay. 
So this uh, observation allows us to translate, uh, to rephrase, uh, or set up this uh, sum of all these uh, states that we want to do in terms of a path integral. So now we have to compute a path integral uh, of a supersymmetric theory, and so we can apply localization to this path integral. This is essentially the idea. Now, um, of course, the steps are the same as before. Okay, one has to find a Q exact uh, action. Now, it turns out that uh, uh, on this particular setup, the full action is Q exact. So we can use the original action. We don't have to introduce anything else. This is just a manifestation of the fact that an index as uh, Guido explained uh, yesterday, is independence of continuous variations in your theory. This is why it, it's a protected object is interesting. And so obviously uh, cannot depend on any parameter in the action. And so the full action should be Q exact. And it is, you can check. Uh, so the full action is Q exact. So in particular, there is no, okay, you can use the full action as our localization term. There is no classical action. Uh, because it's Q exact and give you zero on the BPS locus. So you need to find the BPS locus and compute one loop determinants. Now, um, the BPS locus, I will be sketchy because I have you know, seven minutes. <laughs> so the BPS locus, um, okay, essentially I will just be able to give you the answer. So the BPS locus is given precisely by flat connections. So in the same way as this flat connection for background fields preserve supersymmetry, so uh, do flat connection for the dynamical gauge fields. And so it's the very same thing. Uh, so flat uh, gauge, uh, I mean dynamical connections on, on T2. And so, uh, well, this space is essentially also a torus. So for each component is also a torus because uh, so you can parameterize in this way. But of course, a flat connection uh, is gauge invariant, but gauge transform large gauge transformation can shift it by one in some normalization. And so this lives on a circle, and this lives on a circle. And if you combine it this way, you get that this lives on a torus with the very same tau. So each of the cartons of, uh, and moreover, there is a condition the flat, con the, uh, flat connection should commute on the torus um, just because of the structure of the cycles. Um, and so this BPS locus is given essentially by uh, R, well, well, this is the rank of the gauge group, copies of, of the space time torus by using this, this map. OK. And now, uh, and now you go and compute your, uh, your one-loop determinants. Of course, again, the problem is trivial because it's T2. So once again, you do just Fourier modes. And you find two interesting, uh, um, two interesting uh, features. So the first feature is that uh, these one-loop determinants now have uh, divergences on the space where you are supposed to integrate in this T2. Because the form of these one loop determinants is uh, for, for chiral multiplets, um, up to factors which are not very important. Um, so they are a ratio of Jacobi theta functions. So, um, so for instance, for a, for a chiral multiplet, mm, you will get something like. Let me call this just a, suppose it's just a, a, a U1 <coughs> So you get this, this ratio of uh, Jacobi theta functions and these Jacobi theta functions have zeros on the torus This is a function of Y and of, uh, sorry I should call, well X is, uh, is this the same thing. So x is uh, 2 pi i, I guess some um, u 
and this u is this parameter and it parameterizes the flat connection. So this u lives on the torus. Yes. Thanks. So, but the important point is that there are divergences because this theta function, this uh, Jacobi theta function, has zeros on the torus, uh, and so there are some poles, and you are supposed to integrate over this x. And so you have this torus where you are supposed to integrate, and there are poles in what you have to integrate, which is not very nice. So this is one feature. The other feature is that now there are fermion zero modes. And these fermion zero modes come from uh, the Gagini, uh, in particular the Gagini along the Cartan directions. <coughs> and the point is that these Gagini do not have any uh, fugacity associated with them, because of course Gagini cannot be charged under flavor symmetries. The le more specifically, the right moving Gagini is not charged on the left moving R charge. So I'm not charged under this. And the Gagini along the Cartan are not charged under uh, an uh, the, 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 the maximal torus in the gauge, uh, in the gauge group. Uh, so there is no fugacity that can uh, remove, lift these uh, zero modes. And so one is left with zero modes from a uh, left moving Gagini. In particular, there are n if n is the rank of the gauge group. Um, and so we are in this more complicated situation in which there are these fermion zero modes and we have to uh, deal with them. Uh, but in fact, it turns out that these two problems solve, uh, well, one solves the other. So they take uh, care of each other. And the way in which essentially this works, and I will be very schematic here, is that um, these zero modes form, uh, uh, can be organized into um, uh, supermultiplets, if you want zero dimensional supermultiplets. And so schematically, um, so schematically one can organize the uh, zero modes into u, uh, let me call them u bar, uh, lambda plus, lambda plus bar, and d0. And so these are uh, our fermion zero modes. Uh, these are our bo uh, bosonic zero modes. So these are, in fact, the, 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 the bosonic coordinates that we are integrating over. Um, so it, it's not so bad that they appear in the same uh, multiplet. Uh, and this is a zero mode for the auxiliary field. This is also a constant. And these zero modes form an off-shell uh, um, multiplet. So in particular, one can set up, so Q is the supercharge that we can preserve, and one gets something like the following. So one gets this, this action, and in fact both q and q tilde square to zero. And so, um, and so the formula now that we are supposed to, to compute is the following. So our index schematically should be an integral over the bosonic zero modes. Uh, but now it's also an integral over the fermionic zero modes. Okay, here I'm putting this zero. And uh, let's restore, at this point, also the integral around this uh, d, uh, zero modes for d. And the object that we have to compute, to, to integrate, is uh, the product of all the one-loop determinants. But since there are these zero modes, as I said, we should expand. So the, the, f the first leading term does not contribute because of this. So we really have to write 
we really would have to write this uh, as a full dependence on the fermion zero modes. And now, so the question is, okay, how to compute this? Um, well, we know how to compute the standard one loop determinant. This is what we have discussed uh, so far. And in fact, if we set to zero these fermionic, ze all these fermionic zero modes and D, this is just the one loop determinant that we have computed many, many times. So the U, U bar with the zeros, this is just the standard one loop determinant. Uh, that we have computed and it is holomorphic in U. So it does not depend on U bar. So how do you compute this most general object? And here the, the nice thing is that supersymmetry uh, comes to the rescue because this object here, now this is written in off-shell uh, formulation and so this should be, uh, m m must be closed under supersymmetry. So in particular, for instance, Q tilde of this Z, and I am uh, just two, two minutes just to finish. Um, so this is supersymmetric. So let's see what does it mean. Um, well, essentially, you just apply this super algebra, this action. What is Q uh, Because there are two. So if you want, there is one complex supercharge, which corresponds to the 0, 2, so Q and Q tilde. Uh, we could use Q if one gets the same answer. So what do we have? Well. Uh, you see uh, Q acts on, on U bar and transforming in lambda plus bar. So for, uh, sorry, QT, the transform in minus lambda plus. So this is minus lambda plus in the derivative of Z with respect to U bar. And then Q tilde, so on U doesn't act. Well, it gives you zero. This gives you zero. Uh, but this doesn't give you zero. And so I give you d plus, so we have some, sorry, d zero. Okay, so this relation comes from supersymmetry. And now if we take this equation, which is equal to zero, and we di differentiate once again with respect to, uh, once more with respect to lambda plus, we get that the second derivative of z with respect to lambda plus, lambda bar plus, um, is equal to what? Is equal to 1 over d0 uh, dz over d u bar. And, uh, um, and of course, since we have differentiated twice with respect to already lambda plus and lambda bar plus, uh, this object is just at, um, is just a component of lambda plus, lambda plus bar equal to 0 because we cannot have two lambda plus, these are anti-commuting. So we get this nice relation, and you see this is precisely what we need. Because the object that we need uh, that contributes to this integral is precisely the second derivative, right? It's not the first term in the expansion, it's the one that contains lambda plus and lambda plus, but this relation is telling us that this is related to the component that we know. Because this component here is the one in lambda plus and lambda plus is equal to zero, but differentiated with respect to u bar. And so using this, uh, we can rewrite this as just the integral in d to u and the integral in d, d zero of this object here. Uh, but now you see that this is uh, a total derivative with respect to u bar. And so combining with this, we can apply Stokes theorem, and this gives us a contour integral. And of course, there is this <coughs> still this zero integration that I don't have time to explain all the details. So you can just get the main idea. But the idea is that you get now a contour integral along some specific contour of, of, of z. Uh, and what this is is, is, is this z1 loop, because it's the one evaluated at zero fermion, uh, with no, no, no zero modes. So this is just the Z1 loop, which we know how to easily compute. Um, and so first of all, we have gotten rid of the uh, zero modes. And moreover, you see a contour integral solves the problem of the divergence, because we have converted an integral of all this space to a contour integral. 
And it turns out that this contour integral is at the boundary of the region, and the boundary are precisely around the, around the singular point. So you get some nice contour integral. So, okay, I didn't have time to explain what precisely this contour is, because it depends, one has to work a little bit more. Uh, but this is a very specific contour that uh, comes out of the computation, and uh, as I advertised before, this contour is called uh, Jeffrey Kivan uh, residue. Okay, so my time is completely over, so I think I will stop here. <laughs>